<laughs> Yay. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Mother Days podcast. I am your host, Sarah Wright Olson. And I'm Teresa Palmer. Hey, daisies. Oh, my gosh. One of my favorite designers in all the land is joining <laughs> us today. It's Rebecca Minkoff. <laughs> oh, welcome, Rebecca. Hi. <laughs> nice to be here. I'm such big fans. Oh my, oh my gosh, we are big fans. It's crazy. When we got connected, I was like so excited because I remember my very first Rebecca Minkoff bag. Like I remember it. It was this boho sack. I was like, ah, oh, this is the coolest bag. And somebody had given it to me um, on set and it was like as a gift, as like a, a wrap gift. And I was like, oh my gosh, this person is so she. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we are so happy to have you here. You guys, I'm sure everybody knows who Rebecca Minkoff is. If you don't know, she's an amazing designer. She has a full line of bags and shoes and clothes. She's also an author. She has a podcast. She is a mother of four children, which you <laughs> might not know. So that that little tidbit is so rad. Um, we're going to get into all the things today, but we are so, so grateful to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Um, um, my favorite topic outside of my design work is motherhood, breastfeeding, natural uh, childbirth. Yes. So when I was listening to one of your last uh, episodes, I was like, I would love to go in there and talk. So thanks for having me. Uh, oh, oh, my gosh. gosh. We're Thank so excited. You. Before we were just chatting and I was like, oh, it's so cool to meet another mom with four kids, especially a working mom. And she was like, yeah, people literally think I'm insane. I was like, me too. That's I. That is the reflection I get all the time. People are like, "Are you crazy?" Um, I, I wanted to. I wanted to ask you. Did you decide? Did you know? Like, getting into your business, you were like, "I want to do both things. I want to be a mum, and I also want to work like this." Tell me about that. And were you ever nervous that having kids would negatively impact your career at all? Were you ever wobbly about that or not? Good question. So I was seven years into my business before I decided to have kids. I was 31. I started my business at 25 or six years in. So I think for me, um, I didn't feel personally ready to have children, but I felt like I wanted my kids to have a great relationship with my parents. And my mom was Mm. on my ass. Like your ovaries are going to turn to dust. (laughs) So (laughs) I was like, I'll have kids now. And then the minute I had my son, I was like, why didn't I do this earlier? What was I scared of? And we were at a point in the company where I didn't have to, I could have kept working, you know, 120 hour weeks, but I didn't have to. Oh my God. And, you know, I just interviewed someone today and she's like, nothing good happens from six to 9 PM. Nothing impactful happens in terms of what you got done at the office. And so yeah, I think that we were able to sort of lighten my load and that I didn't have to be there nights and weekends. But I think that for me, you know, it wasn't until probably five or six years ago where I was like, I'm not going to check email on the weekends and see what happens. And, you know, <sighs> and I just go, why did I wait that long? Again, nothing happens unless you're, yeah. you know, an emergency room doctor that you need to be on mm-hmm. like that. And I think we've seen, we've seen a huge shift in, in the workforce pushing back. So yeah. I could never tell another mother, like have a baby and start a business at the same time. Like anyone I meet that's doing that, <laughs> I think is, is setting themselves up to fail in something, in some regard, or, yeah, or make sacrifices yeah. that looking back, they aren't excited about because I didn't have Mm -hmm. that experience. I was already, you know, seven years in and was able to sort of be able to focus a little bit on on baby. Wow. I love hearing you say that about like checking email over the weekend. I think when you like have your own business or, you know, even when you're working at a, a established business and you are, you know, pretty new there, you feel like. I just have to like do everything, you know, I have to cover everything and I have to show up and I have to prove myself. And like, as a, you know, business owner, I'm always like, well, I I just have to be available all the time, you know? And like, I want to hit up my customer service right away and like check, like do everything. And 
when you do that, you're spread so thin. There's like just nothing left for you. You're not, you're sort of like half doing the parent thing and half doing the work thing. And you're sort of like, yeah, let me do that puzzle with you. But also I'm like checking an email. Like it just doesn't work. It feels so, you feel so torn. So I love that you said that because my husband and I both like really try to put the phone away on the weekends and just focus on the kids and like do, we have our routine of the beach on the weekends, but but, um, but f- just knowing like how massive your company is and what you have, it's like so cool to hear you say that you're doing that as well. Um, are your kids close together in age? Like what are the ages and how did you spread that out? So they're the first three are about three years apart each. And that was consciously done. I thought I was done after the third and then five years went by and I woke up at 41 and I said to my husband, I was like, we're not done. <laughs> he was like, uh, we're done. And I was like, oh you God. don't really have a choice in the matter. Oh my God. <laughs> so I surprised him with a, with a pregnancy and, um, I, I was approaching it like I'm 41. It's probably not going to happen. It took me a while to get pregnant with the last one, almost 10 months. And, um, wow. you know, whatever, let's just see. And then it happened almost right away. So I feel so <gasps> wow. beyond blessed that he joined us. And oh. he's just the best you thing have, that you I had ever did. soul baby. I did. I had uh. this person just waiting. He was like, I'm ready to come in. (laughs) I'm ready. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so now I have built in childcare. Like today I went to the gym upstairs in my building and my 12 year old watched the baby for 20 minutes, you know? So I have, you know, I have nice. And then my daughter is in love with him and I call her the other mother. So I have some great help, which has been awesome. Oh oh my gosh. Wait, this makes me so happy hearing your age spread because I also spread my kids out really far. And I did that because like, I just never felt ready to have another one until you know it was like they were going off to preschool or right before it was like three years apart and then four years apart and everyone that listens knows that I want to have a fourth right so (laughs) so um that would be like a four years plus spread as well so I mean um, if we didn't expire I would tell women to wait five years between all their kids because I was so in it with you know three, yes. then a, then a baby. And then a, then a three-year-old and a five-year-old and a baby that you, you couldn't enjoy yeah. these moments that I'm enjoying now for the first time, because you have Aww. to change another, you know, there's a tantrum or a diaper or whatever it is. Yes. Right. And now I have three fully formed humans that you can actually like, you know, engage with. And then we just have one baby. So I, I love the age spread, even though later on he might feel lonely. Oh, no, I think it'll be amazing. And you're in New York, right? You had all your babies in New York City. So, I mean, we've heard so many tales of New York and New York doctors or midwives or like whatever it is. So um, how was it giving birth in New York City? Like, what was that like? So three were in New York. One was in Florida, which I'll which I'll speak to. So I had I had the same midwife for the first two. And then Mm -hmm. for the third one, I had a practice that I met through that midwife that practiced, you know, natural birth and kind of wanted, you know, as, as little interventions as possible. What I will say is that New York is incredibly, uh, wants to follow the rules and has all their legal crap. And I really wanted to avoid some things like, like it or not, I didn't want, you know, the baby to be given any shots in the hospital. I wanted no eye goop. And, you know, with my first, I was told flat out in the middle of a childbirth class, like you, we will call child protective services if you refuse. What? <gasps> if you refuse vitamin K and you refuse uh, the, the eye goop, then we'll call it. And I was like, well, guess we're doing those things. They've just oh changed. My oh my God. Yeah, they've just changed the law now. So now you can sign a waiver. But I think even though, you know, I never felt comfortable doing it at home because God forbid anything goes wrong and you are at rush hour, New York city traffic. Like that to me was a recipe for disaster. So I will say like my first one, you know, was, was on the edge of a C-section, which I didn't realize until after he came out. My second one, they kind of left me more alone. And my third one, I was in the room for eight minutes. I literally labored oh my God. until <laughs> I was giving birth in the hallway. And then they like wheeled me in and he came out eight minutes later. So 
Having said what? that, yeah. So having said that about New York City, when I went to Florida, they had an intake nurse, and she's like, "Tell me what you want." I mean, she went through so many questions that you're never asked on the factory farm of New York City. So much care. You got your own room, oh. like in New York, you don't even get your own room to like recover. You're there with another oh, woman God. and a sheet that separates <gasps> you. You've just oh, given wow. birth. You're sharing a bathroom for Christ's sake with the blood and the oh thing. My God. So in, in Florida, I was like, this is so civilized and human, oh, you know, and you don't have to wow. ask them. Like I was going down my list. Like I want delayed cord clamping. Blah, 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 blah. And she's like, this is what we do. Just tell us anything That's outside standard. of all this. And I was, oh my I was gosh. blown away. So New York is still oh. tough, which is, it's weird, right? You have on the one hand, Let's take in migrants. Let's help the homeless. Let's do all these things. But like, let's treat women like cattle when they come to give birth, which is, it's sad, unfortunately. That's so backwards. Yes. Very backwards. I had to like, in order to get a private room here, because I refused, I was like, I had to share like press and notable articles about myself and like make up a story that there might be a fan at the hospital just to get a private room. Oh my gosh. And then then you still pay for it. So it's just, it's just a weird, it's a weird system here. Wow. (laughs) That's, that's so wild. I actually think that's why I ended up having my last three in Australia because they have like a birth center Mm -hmm. in a hospital. So it can be like a home birth vibe, but you're on a floor with only midwives. And if anything, God forbid, went wrong, you just go up a floor to the hospital section. Yeah. And so that, that's actually why I birthed in Australia. I was like... I just want to, it to feel different. Totally. So I was like, all right, we're, we're just birthing there now. <laughs> yeah. And next I want to birth at the farm. I keep I saying know, Sarah, I, I was like, we should have our babies at Ida May Gaskin's farm I, next. I did <laughs> ask my husband for the third. I was like, should we drive to the farm and just do it? Tennessee. And he was like, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. <laughs> you're, you're a lunatic. <laughs> the dream though right because you read the book and you get so I mean the book for me is like pure Kool-Aid I'm like mm-hmm. yes that's the I want all the, yeah spiritual midwifery and anime's guide to childbirth but like I'm right there I was like what hippie outfit can I wear during labor like I, I was just like all oh. in you know <laughs> and I love all the terminology like the rushes the and rushes. it was so psychedelic yes. 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 And, oh my yes. gosh it was I read that before I was a mom I read it in Big Sur I was staying in this like really crazy hippie house (laughs) in Big Sur and I saw this book and I was like oh what spiritual midwifery I always wanted to be a midwife and I got it and I read it from probably in about four hours like the whole book and I was like I'm obsessed and this was still (laughs) three years before I ever had babies and I wasn't even with the partner that I went to have babies with but that was it like that for me solidified this like natural birth passion for you like where did you learn about this stuff was it like you saw the business of being born and that informed you or were you always interested in this kind of thing I had no clue I knew my mom gave birth to all of us without any assistance. And then my friend was pregnant and she was like, do you mind if we watch this documentary, The Business of Being Born? And I was like, sure, whatever. Um, And I was still a ways from having kids and I watched it and I couldn't believe what I was watching. And then when I got pregnant, I went down the wormhole, you know? Yes. And once you (laughs) see it, you can't unsee it or unknow it. And so I really prepared for the, the first birth like a marathon. You know, I did the classes, uh-huh. I did the reading, I did the husband coach childbirth, like anything I could think of to sort of prepare myself. And even, even with all the preparation, when you have those contractions, it's you and God, and I'm not even a big believer in God, right? But like, it's you and yeah. some higher power and you're just, you know, you have to do what you have to do to go through it. But I'll never forget, I was pushing and in the class, you know, they, you know, visualize it going out your vagina. And I was pushing with that visualization. And my midwife was like, if you think that's, what's going to get this baby out, it's not. So you better figure out another <laughs> way to push. And I was like, well, there's only one other way it could come out. And that is through my butt. So I'm going to push like that's I'm right. taking the biggest dump of my life. And then that got him out. The biggest shit. 
That we always say that. Oh I, I was at a friend's birth recently and I was like, just like push like you're doing the biggest poo you've ever done. It really feels it just like way. Way. <laughs> it was so it it's crazy. Done. You have to push into your bottom. Yeah, yeah we talk about that a it lot on the podcast. So, it's such a weird feeling, but I, I love that your midwife said that. My midwife said something really similar too. Is she was like, What are you thinking about right now? And I was like, I'm visualizing like <laughs> going through this <laughs> tunnel and I'm like, you know, I'm just like talking about, I don't know, all this crazy stuff. And, and she was like, okay, don't do that. All of that. Don't do that. It's, <laughs> none of that is working. I don't know where you read that. And I was like, I did read, I read, you know, to like have these like visualizations. And so like, I was like bringing my baby. And she's like, no, that's not, this is not how it's going to work. And it's definitely stalling you out. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, fine. But you also have okay. ginormous babies. So I know. you don't like, she's seen my birth videos where I'm like, <laughs> like breathing, yeah, like I'm blowing out a little candle. Me. I'm Mm-mm. just doing these little grunts and like, you know, doing like breathing my baby out. And she was like, that doesn't work for me. No. My kids are like 11 pounds oh and 10 pound babies. God. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yes. I know. It's like, it's like I'm, I'm forcing like giant, you know, like a giant four month old to navigate its way <laughs> through my little pelvis. That's unbelievable. <laughs> so, oh I'm definitely not quiet. You know, we have this funny story again with the first, we put a sign and we said we wanted a quiet environment no talking at all so I could focus <laughs> so we have this sign on the outside of the door it says like quiet silent birth and I am I sound like a like a gutted cow like like just like <laughs> being tortured and the nurse even commented to my husband she's like um it sounds like the sign should be on the inside of your door so that you can remind your wife <laughs> like, but I'm I'm not quiet this especially this last one I don't know if it was the five years Same, but like my I, last one Ugh. I felt like Mel Gibson in Braveheart when he's being quartered <laughs> wow. you know ripped yes open. yes <laughs> Oh That's my God. Amazing. I was the same with my fourth for some reason. I was so unbelievably loud. With my, oh I had back my labor. gosh. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> Everyone's like, you were going to wake up the entire street. I had a home birth. And that was like, really? what? what is going on? This is not really like you. Oh, I was man. like, I don't know. I need to dig deep with this one. <laughs> was oh it, did gosh. it feel different for you? Your pregnancy at 41, you know, giving birth at 42. Was that different than, you know, than being pregnant in your 30s asking for a friend yes <laughs> um, my first two felt really strong and great bounced back very quickly my third one I noticed towards the last let's say six weeks like my pelvis just the pain um yes of your pubic bone separating is basically what we figured out what happened um oh. and that was really hard to recover from um also my pelvic floor like gone So I approached my fourth with a lot of pelvic floor therapy going in and as much work as I could do. I mean, you name it, I had an appointment every week, just knowing (laughs) that my body was older. um, And even with all that, still had the incredible uh, discomfort for the last six weeks in my back and then my pubis bone and pelvic floor still gone. I'm still, I'm still repairing it. So I don't uh, know if it's age or just the shape of my uterus or whatever, but it yes. it really mm-hmm. took a toll. And, you know, even though I would love to keep going, like, I don't think my body can handle it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, that's. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I read this amazing um, interview with you and you were just talking about motherhood and you were talking about I think it was like in the middle of the pandemic the interview came out and you were talking about your musical beds and it sounds so funny (laughs) how you were like you would go into your daughter's bed with the twin beds and then your husband was in the other bed with the boys and then because your son just like really wanted to keep breastfeeding at night (laughs) time and I read it and I was like oh how relatable I love this so much yes yes (laughs) we're still there we're in a new era of them them there my daughter wants to be on the floor the other the five-year-old comes in at the foot of the bed which gives me bad dreams every time I don't know why him laying at my feet gives me bad dreams and then the baby's in between us so my husband oh my god the other day my husband broke he's like I just want to sleep in a bed with my wife 
And I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry. <Yes. laughs> Sorry. Sorry. And you're like, um, that's so nice for you. But that's not how I feel. <laughs> Oh my I mean, god! I slept with oh my parents god. Just hot. I was nine, so like I don't, yeah. I don't have a thing Same. about it personally. Like I'm not like I need to be alone in my room, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I same. same. I wanted to be in my mum's bed forever. I think I was with my mum. It was just me and her. I was slept in her bed until I was twelve or something. Yeah. And uh, so whenever like Bodie or one of Bodie's my nine year old, whenever he's like, can can I fall asleep in your bed? Like we oh. end up just having so many of them in the bed and I position them in certain ways. So it <laughs> works like Mark and I, and then we have the baby between us and then we have the kids like top tail to the baby. So it's like her feet and their feet oh touching my God. <laughs> and it sort of works. Sarah's got a permanent bed next to her main yeah. bed where Esme sleeps. We call it floor bed. You know, there's floor a bed Texas next to me. king and a Wyoming king. Look it up. They're nine feet by nine <gasps> feet. You two can have oh. a family bed. I'm going to get one one day. Oh <laughs> my gosh, that's a great wow. idea. Yeah, because I, I have another friend idea. who pushed two giant beds together. <laughs> yeah, and I was yeah, like, same. oh, that's a cool idea. But my daughter sleeps on the floor bed, and then my um, other daughter is the youngest. She's three, so she's in bed. And then uh, lately, Eric has been in Wyatt's room, and they've been sleeping in the same room together. So it's Eric and Wyatt, my husband. And why <laughs> and then me and the, the girls, girls so we have room. like yeah we have girls room boys room. Oh my gosh. it's refreshing to <laughs> oh hear though because it's amazing I feel like a lot of my friends are so um strict about the boundaries in the bedroom so it's nice to see other women just saying fuck it it's a village and we're yes gonna, we're gonna all be together it yeah is. it's so and it's yeah. so it's such a like short amount of time in which you have that you know it's like that's not forever and it's gonna be like such a great memory and i have a girlfriend who if you ever saw the movie crudes the the family yeah. of crudes yes. they're like they cavemen. okay they sleep other. in the sleep pile <laughs> yeah. yeah so she always laughs at me because we'll we'll like go on vacation together and she's like how many rooms do you need and i'm like one i'm like we're a sleep pile like we're good <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, it's it is so refreshing i love hearing that i'm like oh we're all going through it we're all like just yes. in it with our kids how do you function when you have to like wake up the next morning and then you're the boss and you're running your company and do you like is everyone really flexible if you're like I really had no sleep like I gotta skip out in this meeting or are you just like nah it is what it is I'm used to having interrupted sleep and you just like go forth (laughs) I think that I can live on a certain amount of no sleep um that I've somehow just adapted to. Whereas I have friends who, you know, literally have scary thoughts if they don't get enough sleep. So I feel like I've crossed the threshold, but if anything throws that out more than that, then it's hard to function, but I'll still get up and come to the office because I also like, I hate canceling. I'm very type A. I want to be on time. So I'll usually um, just stick it out, you know, and try and go to bed early the following night. But like we had a bout of teething and fevers and whatever. And so, I, you know, the four, four Ugh. times a night he was waking up to feed turned into whatever, six. And then Eight. I'm just like, oh, my yeah. God, please, I want to <laughs> die. But I also have stopped oh, drinking. Yeah, so that helps um mm. with fatigue mm, and I'm trying to so eat good. healthier and take more supplements so at least I'm getting energy from other sources that I'm not getting from nighttime oh yeah oh that's so good I feel like that's always the first thing to go out the window though is self-care when you're like meeting the needs of all these other people in your family Mm -hmm. and then you're working and then it's like I'm so busy like I don't even have time to take care of myself I have only just like after like Sarah and Mark have both been like you really need to do this for yourself I've only just recently started realizing like oh I probably should start eating a little healthier I did that thing where I'm like I'm vegan so that's pretty healthy and then I was like actually I'm eating like a junkie vegan vegan. I need to like that (laughs) That's why I've been having my green juices every morning. I've been doing my intermittent fasting, feeling so much better. But when you have such a busy life and you have so many kids and there's so much going on, I always feel like that's the first thing to go 
out the door is just taking care of self. So do you have any other rituals that you love to do that you try and fold in? Yeah. I'd love to hear like, what's your go-to? Yeah. So just to go go back, my husband naturally likes to wake up around six or seven. So he is up with anyone that wakes up, including baby. And then I'll go back to sleep until eight. I don't have to be at my office until 10. So it allows me to get a workout in as well. And then he'll work out kind of later in the day. So that alone is a game changer. And I encourage all mothers to talk to their partners about splitting the shifts. Um, Yeah. And then my routine is kind of done in coordination, like with others. If I'm in the shower, I make sure to put, you know, take the time to do my, um, my lymphatic drainage. I have these like suction cups or like just taking a minute to put on the extra lotion. I take my vitamins at night. I exercise almost every day, not for a long time, 20 minutes, 30 minutes is what I can figure out. And I'm like, you know, I'm constantly like, all right, you, you're 12. Okay. You can probably not let my baby die. You watch the baby or, (laughs) you know, (laughs) uh, sneaking it in somewhere. Um, and I do, you know, as the boss, I do have the luxury of like, if I'm going to leave a little early, I do, I didn't used to do that, but now, you know, now I have no shame when I'm walking out of the office early. I'm like, you know what? I've earned it. It's been 18 years. I think it's fine. No one's going to be like, oh, she left yeah. at five, not at six o'clock. You know, <laughs> <laughs> 18 years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's so impressive. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. That's amazing. And you started the company with your brother. Is that right? Did I read that? Yeah. I started the company by myself and then realized I was in over my head, especially on the financing and business side. And so originally what started out as like, Hey, can you give me some advice? Turned into him and, you know, becoming my partner. And then when we sold the business last year, he exited and, um, my name's on the door. So I plan to continue on. <laughs> yeah, you oh, do. <laughs> amazing. Oh, wow. Like what, what an incredible thing. There are so many, we always get people writing in, especially I think out of the pandemic, so many mothers have written in to us and parents saying like, oh, we really want to start taking our own hours and working for ourselves. And like, we have dreams of becoming an entrepreneur and, but it's like too scary for us to start. And so I feel like we need to do an entire episode on like building a career as a mother, but do you have any, just any tips for our listeners if they want to sort of dip their toe into something else and, you know, take back control, take back their own schedule? Like, how do you even get started. I know it starts with an idea, but then where do you take that? So the first thing I would say is if you love what you do and you're working for someone currently before you quit, you know, see if you can get them to think outside the box and push the boundaries and say, I've proven to you that I am really good at all these things. These are the hours I want to work. This is the flexibility I want to have. Let's do a trial. You know, I I encourage that before someone kind of quitting. Um, if you are, if you are dead set on quitting, you know, can you afford as a family for you to devote your full-time focus to it? Um, if you can't, then your option is working at night and you're going to be burning the candle at both ends and you're not going to have time to be a parent and it's going to suck. So I would say like, you know, option A, B and C. And once you've kind of sussed that out, there's so much glamour today around being a billion dollar company and overnight success and, you know, rich and famous. And it really is about hard work, long hours, late nights, giving it everything you've got. Um, and there's no shortcuts. There's definitely things that can help us, right? AI might be able to write some copy or build you a website. Um, yeah, but it, you know, AI is never going to, replace human creativity and the human spirit. And when you are buying something from a brand, because it is imbued and embodied whatever they stand for. And so, you know, you are the soul of that if you are the entrepreneur and it's your company. And so I just encourage you to go after slow growth, profitability, and um, standing for something and, and being okay that you're going after a very focused customer base you don't want to be everything to any everybody because then you're a Walmart, which is great. Yeah. But, you know, but people are seeking out authentic connections with companies and brands. And so be that thing that stands for whatever it is and be the best, best at it. But there's no shortcuts. I've been doing this 18 years and I'm just beginning to see what, what opportunities, 
you know, I thought would happen in year 10 would be. So you have to give it time. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing advice. I actually was reading that you have like a female founders collective, like where you talk to women who are, you know, starting businesses or like have businesses. And will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I launched in 2018 with my co-founder, Allie Wyatt, and we really came together um, ideating how do we make women rich? right? How do we <laughs> empower founders to be successful? And hopefully yes. they'll make changes within their companies that better support women in their communities. Um, so we have a membership base of almost 25,000 women. We have free content. We have a paid private community that gives you on-demand access to like all the content we've created in the last four years, but it's all the unsexy stuff of business. It's you know, how to, how to fundraise, how to prepare for an exit, how to, you know, get more ROI on your top of funnel marketing, you name it. We've, we probably held a webinar or seminar on it. Um, yeah. And then we have in-person events as well. We have community lead uh, meetups in local areas. So, you know, the whole goal is education, community, and giving these women access to each other, frankly. So, Feel free to check it out, um, femalefoundercollective.com. Oh my gosh, I'm already like, I'm going to have Lovewell to like jump yeah. on board with that. Like yeah. my company, I'm like, ah. Oh. I didn't realize that you, that that was your um, company because I've been like, like looking up stuff on Females Founder Collective for years. And so I had no idea that that was you until I read that. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, of course, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, that's so cool. And I, I was also in that same article I was reading about you. I read this thing about how you like breastfeed at board meetings and like that was, yes, you know, girl. such, a, by the way, I, I love that so much because just like being an example, your, you know, your name, exactly your name is on the door. This is your company, but being that, that example, like this is, this should be the norm. Mm-hmm. It should be okay to like sit here and do this and it's part of our you know lives we're moms like you know it's it's amazing so can you talk a little bit about what you were um you know what you're wanting to sort of show to people as you're making that a part of your like business meeting or whatever for an example for other women you know I I went back to work six weeks after I had my first not because I was called back to work but to be honest I was a little bored And I felt like if I could Uh go back to work five hours, you know, half time, I would basically go half day. Then I could get my fix of him, but also be stimulated with what I needed. And I was like, the only way I'm doing this, and I'm like reaching for my, hold on, my secret, my secret of the trade here is if I pump and I'm not going to be at work for the four hours and then go hide in a closet for half the time. And I just said, you know what? Fuck it. If I can hide what I'm doing, this is not sponsored content. If I can hide what wow. I'm doing, this really <laughs> ugly fucking apron with the, with the wire, then I'm just going to put the pump in my back oh. pocket and continue on. And once I did yes. that, I wow. thought I can do this anywhere. So I did do it in board meetings. I do it in cabs. I don't hide it at all. I will go yeah. about my day doing it. And I want other women to know that you don't need to go into the closet in the stall and that if we were all to get comfortable and now it's, it's almost like we're not the ladies of yesteryear that had the big clunky things. I mean, yeah, this thing that's is right. this big. What breast pump do you use? Uh, yeah. What is yeah. that one? This is the Medela freestyle. So literally oh. this, this oh. is it. And then the tubes, right? And so wow. there's no excuse for any of us to feel shame or, you know, like yeah. you're not going to see anything under the pump. I get it fully situated. The only time um, I wasn't even uncomfortable and I find it hilarious was like I was in Japan and they have a different culture and it was mostly yes. men. And I yeah. said, I need to pump, but don't worry, guys. I got my thing. And I started getting out my supplies and like literally they flew out of there. Like you've never seen that. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Oh I give you time. God. I give you time. You take your time. Go do it. And oh that was the God. only time that like, <laughs> I was like, well, okay. So I think it's on us, you know, here's the thing we talk about, well, th- well some of us talk about this, but no, no person's ever going to say to you, you look like you're in gorge, sweetie. Do you need to go pump or do you want to do that yeah. here? Oh my right. 
or you yeah, had exactly. a baby. What's your pumping schedule? Let me note that down and clear the calendar. Like no one's ever going right. to do that. Not because, <laughs> not because they're being mean or not thoughtful, just because it's not how it is. And so right. it's on us to sort of say, no, this is how it has to be. And this is what we have to do for ourselves yeah. and for others coming up so that it, it changes. Otherwise, we're all going to be hiding somewhere, apologizing for like wanting to feed our babies. Yes. Ugh. Ugh. Wow. That is so empowering. I love it so much. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for doing that. The amount of times, like even in the media, like I've been shamed for public breastfeeding. I mean, given it was about 10 years ago and I think the narrative has slightly changed, but I would walk out of Cafe Gratitude in Los Angeles and get snapped with like the, the baby. I was, he was a toddler. He was probably like 14 months old, like on my boob. And then there'd be a big heading about like, oh, Teresa Palmer breastfeeding in public. This is crazy. It's crazy. And I was like, is it? Is that, <laughs> is that actually crazy? I mean, come on guys. It's so, it's so wild. I secretly want someone like I'm like waiting for like the person on the airplane to confront me and I'll be like, oh yeah, you, you <laughs> fucked with the wrong person. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Uh, oh my God. That's so and right. Did, for you, did breastfeeding come quite easily in those early days or not? Was that like a challenging journey? You know, it always looked easy. So I thought when I had my first, like, oh, I'll just do this. And I could not figure out the hand motion and the thing. And I was failing. Um, and I was, he, my, my son had low blood sugar. So they were like formula sending up upstairs to get the sugar water. And that to me was already like, off to a bad start. And so Lord. I'll never forget this beautiful woman came into my room at 2 a.m. And she's like, I'm going to show you what to do. And she like grabbed my boob and showed me the, you know, how to get it in his mouth and that latching. And then he was probably tongue tied. So it was the most painful, excruciating activity for like six weeks. Uh, and my, you know, my toes would curl when he would wake up, but I was like, I'm sticking through this. And then I never made enough. I made four ounces and my, he needed five and I would sneak an ounce. You shouldn't do this. I'm not a doctor, but I would sneak an ounce in so that my nanny wouldn't then thaw another pack, right. To get to the fifth <laughs> ounce. Yeah. And I felt like a criminal. And so with my, yes. with my second, I was like, how do I change this so that I'm not this anxious about never having enough? And I said, yeah. let me pump on day one and see if I can trick my body. And so I, I sort of started pumping from day one when I was most engorged and I just made this huge stash that then once I knew I yes. had, I don't know, I was like, I need 300 by the time I go back to work and that'll last me for, and just that made me relax that I had a stash. Yeah. And from there I didn't have supply issues. And then she didn't want to breastfeed after two months because she got a taste of a larger flow bottle, which I didn't even know was a thing. So then I pumped uh. for her. And then with my third, I was like, Oh no, I am not letting you get a bottle for as long as I can. And then we did, <laughs> we lasted for three years. So, um, wow. it's all, it's all over the place. And then with this guy, you know, with COVID and different office hours, I don't have to pump as much because we're only in office three days a week, yes. but this guy loves yeah. food. So he's like, I don't oh, want wow. a bottle and I don't really want a breast, but I want everything you're eating. So it's, it's each kid's different and it's, oh, it's so fun. different. Yeah. So you never know. Wait, so you fed, okay. So you're third, you breastfed until they were three. So I'm lit. I'm right now night weaning my three-year-old and I'm laughing about it because it is so different than night weaning, like, or like weaning a younger baby because the three-year-old's like, uh, why are you doing this to me? I know. Like, what is it? <laughs> like, I don't know how to fall asleep otherwise. Like I know. how, you know, cause we, it's so easy as in a sleep pile. Like it's so nice to just like, if they do wake up, like just give them the boob, they take like three sips and they're back asleep again. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, I want her to like just kind of figure out how to fall asleep on her own. So how how was it different for you with like, did, did you night wean early on or did you are were you like a nighttime breastfeeder or um, like how did that work with with weaning a three year old? So, <laughs> because I'm in it. <laughs> so my sister in law said to come home, say you've been at the doctor and you have band-aids on your mm-hmm. boobies and your, your boobies are broken. And so <laughs> during the daytime, he'd reach and I'd be like, oh, my boobies are broken. I'm so sorry. And then at night when he would wake up, I'd be like, they're still broken. And, you know, you'd have to deal with the crying and the freak out. And, you know, I would rock yes. him to sleep or sing to him. And sometimes you're so tired. You're like, God, it would be so much easier just to give him the fucking breast. Just to give it to him. But yeah, I yes. think I was also at a point where it wasn't even enjoyable anymore. I was, I was more like, get away from me. Don't touch me anymore. And so I knew yeah, so you get touched out. I get touched out. And so I knew that I had to continue with the broken boobies and it, it was like a week. And then, it, and then, <laughs> and then we did it. And he, but he still asks, oh. he's five. And when he sees Leo on, he's like, can I have the other one? I'm like, no, no, you can't. No, I know. So does poet, my four year old. <laughs> she was like, yesterday she said to me, but why do four year olds have to stop drinking boobies? And I was like, well, they, really good they question don't, there, poet. but like, you know, some two year olds don't drink boobies. Like some one year olds don't drink boobies. Oh my God. And, it, and he, she was like, but Prairie's too, and she still drinks boobies. Oh. And I was like, I, I yes, know. I it's know. So, that's so it was hard. the hardest that's, for her of all my kids. Yeah, so that's like winter right now. She's like, uh, you know, struggling so much at night just because during the day it's like not a big deal. But at nighttime she's like, you know, crying. And last night she was like, I want daddy. And I was like, great, say it a little bit louder. <laughs> <laughs> I want daddy. And I'm like, okay. I think also here. sleeping like, with daddy is helpful. I think I remember him sleeping yeah, with, yeah. with my husband so that he, they know they can't get it from him. It's just innate, you know? Yes. You should have winter join the boys room. I should. Yeah. The winter's going to hide. It's just going to be me in the big bed and Eric going to pull out with all the kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. oh, poor oh, guy. <laughs> my God. Oh, my God. Well, thank you so much. You've been such an incredible guest and so much wisdom. And I love talking about all these wonderful things. And Sarah and I totally geeked out. Oh, I know. Know. And you I listen to the podcast. And I, and I don't get to talk about it often. It's not like when I'm talking about, you know, my business, I'm like, and by the way, everyone should breastfeed and have a natural birth. Oh my God. I know. I love that you had natural births. Like it's, that's amazing. And that you were able to do that. And I mean, that's, you know, I think sometimes like rare, especially in New York city from friends of ours. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think of it, you know, we talk about female empowerment and claiming our rightful, whatever, in the workforce and on the scale of being paid equally. And then we don't talk about that, what it means to be owning ourselves as women and our innate powers and abilities, right? We just go, oh, let me, let me get drugged for that. Or I'm not strong enough. And like, I'm not going to question any woman who had to have something, you know, but I think there's that choice you make that we've also been told we're weak, right? We've also been yes. told mm-hmm. lay on your back, you're weak. This is a better position for the doctor. And yeah. if that's all you're told, you'll believe it. And so I, you know, my, right. my thing is that's like, right. do what you want to do at the end of the day, but approach it with power and with, I can, and it's, it's yeah. hard as fuck. I think to be able to face what you face in childbirth, if you can do it, I think gives you something back that is intangible that makes you such a strong human. So I encourage, I encourage it and I love talking about it. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Rebecca. We love your brand and we love you. And your podcast. And and your podcast. We love your podcast, Super Women with Rebecca Minkoff. Everyone has got to check it out. It's so fun and wild. And I just can't believe how many things you have going on in your life. (laughs) I love it. And your book. And you wrote a book during the pandemic called Fearless. Is that right? I did. Yes. Yes, I did. I had some extra time my hands. So I wrote it in my bathroom. 
on the floor. Oh <laughs> my gosh, that is so amazing! Oh <laughs> and I have a team. I don't want you guys saying this and people are like, "How does she do all that?" I have a, I have a village in inside the home and outside the home. So I I read recently someone said they tell women, you know, it takes a village, and then it's actually you no know, like you're gonna buy your village, okay? That's where we're at yeah. today. You're, <laughs> yeah. your village, you're so literally going to pay. You're going to pay for the village. <laughs> That's exactly. right. Aww. You pay to have your village around you, yeah. especially when you don't live near family. Uh, so thank you, Daisies. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And thank you, Rebecca. We loved having you. Thanks for having me. Bye. 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 